We are here with Rachel Martin, who is an English teacher and trainer and curriculum designer, and she has also facilitated her share of uh, conversation clubs, both online and face-to-face. So in face-to-face conversation groups, I try to always have um, some sort of a common reference, um, whether I can show a little video clip or we read a little article so that whatever my topic is, the participants have something that they can speak about or some shared language there. And I think keeping that online is pretty helpful. Um, So I don't, you don't want to turn it into a full class. Like this is not a reading writing class. Um, But if there is a common framework, like if they already are in classes together, maybe you can look and see what was their unit, what was their textbook. Um, Maybe you can give a vocabulary list um, at the start, just before you get going. That can be a little bit difficult, I will say, because, um, you know, when you're in person, you write your vocabulary words up on the whiteboard and they stay there for the whole time. Um, If you're teaching or leading something online, you have to be very aware about what is on your slide and what isn't. So um, I, I think you need to prepare a lot for an online conversation group, make your slides, have your questions thought out. Um, maybe put some key vocabulary or put some sentence frames on there, um, sentence starters, so that students can feel confident beginning to answer something. Um, Another thing that I really think about is the order of my questions, Um, starting out with something that's pretty basic or something that's pretty easy that everyone can respond to, and then working toward the more complex questions. because I want to encourage people to, to talk at the beginning and not to clam up or not to feel hesitant. I think, you know, kind of once you loosen someone's tongue, once they're comfortable talking, they're going to keep going. Um, that said, I very deliberately plan some easier questions near the end um, because I don't want students to hit a point like, you know, I'm 20 minutes in, oh, I'm not going to be able to talk anymore beyond this point. So being aware if you have multiple levels or if you have a single level, but even within a single level, you always have students of different abilities. Um, Yeah, I think, I don't know, those weren't any really specific um, techniques, but the goal is to keep them talking. So you're going to plan something, you're going to plan maybe games, you can plan, you know, telephone games, things where you finish a story, Um, don't be afraid to be very directive in terms of this person asks this person a question, or could the two of you, you know, repeat this dialogue or something, um, plan as much as you can, but then don't be afraid to walk away from it. If the conversation naturally evolves, that's okay. The goal was, remember the main goal was, are they talking? Are they participating? Are they communicating? So I would do that. That's great. Thank you. So last question, Uh, do you have any advice for someone who is new to facilitating online conversation classes? What would you tell them? I think something I haven't touched on that I want to make sure I cover is feedback. And when do you give that feedback? How do you give that feedback? It's a little bit more delicate online than it is face-to-face. And the reason for that goes back to so much happens in the whole group. So in in person, maybe I can walk around and I can talk quietly to individuals, to pairs, to small groups. Online, it's much harder to do that. As I've mentioned, I don't want to embarrass anyone. So I almost always reserve my feedback for the end of a discussion. That doesn't necessarily mean the end of the 45 minutes, but if we've talked about a question or a couple of questions, then I might introduce, I heard a couple people say this, and here's a better way to say it, or here's a way that sounds more natural. And that's usually, that's a lot of times how I will phrase it, because I'm not really focused on, you know, is your grammar right or wrong? especially with American English. We are so casual when we speak. There are errors that you don't want to make, but there are also errors that are kind of okay. They'll they'll just slide by. 
but I think students want to be able to express clearly and naturally their ideas. So I'll give those rephrasing or restating or correction, but not immediately after they happen. I don't wanna interrupt the flow of conversation. Um, another technique, I, I learned this from a colleague, um, she sometimes has someone in the group be in charge of listening for corrections or listening for a specific grammar point. So if you're, you're supposed to put the S's on the end of your third person, singulars, verbs or something, if you're working on past tense, I mean, you give them something to focus on. And for that conversation group, they're like the note taker. And that, that's great, you know, if you have someone who's a little bit more advanced, I would also really recommend that they that you encourage them to find positive things as well. I heard this sentence that just sounded cool. I heard this thing that sounded great. Um, that that can be another way to really involve the group and to decenter yourself as the facilitator. You want to you don't want to be invisible, but you want to be as quiet as you can while sparking the conversation for everyone else. So two things you mentioned that I, I also do, I think are really important to think about is the timing of the feedback. <clears throat> is it happening right away or is it happening at the end of everyone speaking on that topic that allows the conversation to flow more and people know you're not going to jump in and interrupt them. They get to say what they want to say. And second, um, not really pointing out to a specific person and not even saying that it was wrong, but even, hey, this is a better way to say that. Or here are some other options on how to say that. Or here's how to sound more natural. Occasionally, someone will say something that you don't want them to repeat. So I think that's important for them to know if it's like really not okay to say. But in general, you can give feedback in an online conversation group because it's more delicate in a more... Um, more nuanced way, I guess, or more generalized way. And you did just kind of bring up something I hadn't thought to include in this, but that is definitely worth thinking about is what happens if someone says something that is insulting or something that is offensive? Um, it can be a very popular strategy with conversation groups to have more controversial topics because that's seen as a way to get people talking. And um, I'm not opposed to that completely, but I think you really need to be aware of who all is in your group. Make sure that someone who represents a minority identity is not having to speak for that. Um, make sure that no one is playing devil's advocate, um, just as you know, a linguistic or intellectual exercise if that's going to be harmful for people in the group. And I think that really depends on how well you know your group, um, making sure that this is an environment where everyone feels welcome, everyone feels ready to speak, um, and that what they say will be welcomed. So um, creating that classroom environment or that environment of respect is just as important in a conversation group as it is in any other setting, and sometimes more so because you want people to feel free to speak but you want them to do it in a way that is respectful and appropriate for the setting. 